I promise this is the last you'll see of me up here. My last segment. Anyhow, I'm here to introduce uh, Chris Baker, and um, Carmen asked me to share some reflections on, on Mr. Baker, on James Baker. Um, I had the great pleasure of meeting uh, Mr. Baker uh, one time when I interviewed him for this book. Uh, it just so happened, and I got very lucky in this regard, because a lot of my uh, parents' friends had gone to Ruston Academy, uh, both Cuban and American, and so naturally I called these friends of my parents to get some you know, little inside information before I interviewed them. Um, they were close friends of his and his family, and they all spoke wonders of Mr. Baker, uh, the love and affection they had for him, and assured me that I would feel the same. So I drove up to, what was it, in Ormond Beach, I guess it was? Uh, it was so long ago, and I interviewed him, and I interviewed him in his apartment there, and he was as motivated to talk to me as he was cordial and absolutely uh, pleasant. Uh, it was an elegant person, gracious, um, one of those people that you look back and say, well, that's someone I should emulate. You know, he did, 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 had that trace of his southern accent and, and manners, and it was just wonderful, a very pleasant person. Of course, he got the ball rolling on Operation Pedro Panda, as we learned in detail. Um, but if I have to share an impression, I was wondering last night, you know, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? What am I going to say? And I'm flipping through my book, uh, looking for something, and I came across this quote, and I said, oh my God, this is perfect. Because what I had written before that was, I think one of the, what most impressed me about Mr. Baker when I met him um, was his love for Cuba, about the life his family lived there, his affection for the Cuban people, and of course spoke of it with such eloquence that it was, that it was very moving to hear him. And I'm sure it was very gratifying to him uh, in a gesture of gratitude to his adopted country to have played such an important role in rescuing so many of its children. And again, as I was going through my book last night, I said, oh, that's good right there. And then I'm going, looking for something else, and I came across a quote that I, I'd forgotten about. I wrote this book many years ago, right? And I asked him, unlike Monsignor Walsh, we talked about the motivation before, I never asked Monsignor Walsh what motivated you to do this, but I, I, I sort of asked uh, Mr. Baker this, you know, what made you do this? Maybe I knew more about interviewing by the time I interviewed him. And I have his quote, his answer in the book. And I even write about his reaction. When I asked him, um, he teared up and in a very choked voice, almost silently, almost like trying to talk through the emotion, he said, I was Cuban. Cuba was my home. Castro was threatening my home. That's it. So with that, um, let me introduce um, Chris. Chris lived in Cuba from 1944 to 1959. He's a graduate of Middlebury College and, of course, Master's and PhD at the University of Florida. Uh, he both taught and was a government advisor in Costa Rica for several years and in 1974 joined the World Council of Credit Unions uh, where he eventually served um, as its CEO from 1993 to his retirement in the year 2000. So without any further delay, uh, Chris Baker. Well, I was wondering whether it would be before or after lunch. Uh, it's a little bit late, but que les haya aprovechado. Uh, it, it is indeed an honor to be able to be here uh, and to share with you some reflections uh, about my father. Uh, I was trying to think what the best way of doing this would be. And I realized that there is a, a range of reflections. One is his own reflections about his experience. The second is my reflections. And the third is what are the reflections of others. And what I'm going to try to do is to blend it all together to try to give you a sense of the man. Not so much the, the actions, because frankly, they've already been covered. Uh, you already have most of the information. I'll be adding some anecdotes, perhaps, that help to round that out. Uh, but I really would like to answer one question. And it goes to the question of why, the question of motivation, the question of what was really behind all of this. And I think it's very important to put it in proper perspective 
Sometimes it gets a little bit murky when people begin to talk about past experiences and people have different recollections and they attribute actions or motivations that perhaps they perceive. For example, the book that was written on, in Cuba about the Pedro Pan movement has a very distinct bias. Uh, and that comes as no surprise. Uh, I'm going to try to give you my sense of the man, my sense of what happened, which I have reconstructed, really, because both my brother and I were away in college when these activities were taking place. Uh, quite frankly, we were not allowed to go home for Christmas 1960. We, we would normally have gone in the summertime and then again at Christmas time. Uh, we didn't really know about this trip to Miami. We didn't find out about what Dad had been involved in with a range of other people uh, until many years later. So it's been a process of reconstruction that I, I share with you. I want to start really with one of the best uh, set of reflections that I have been able to find written by Guillermo Martinez Arocena, who was a classmate of mine. He went to Ruston until he had to, he had to leave Cuba uh, because he was involved in certain types of activities uh, during the Batista period that required that he leave the country rather than stay. Uh, so he's a long time uh, friend uh, and knew my father very well. At the time of my father's death in 2001, he said the following. He expected us to become good citizens and to respect the rights of others. Despite almost 25 years as a teacher, first and then as headmaster of the best bilingual private school in Precastro's Cuba, James D. Baker never spoke Spanish fluently. He didn't have an ear for the language. He had difficulty with those harsh double R's, R's, uh, that Cubans like to trill. It was not easy for him to deal with Spanish language syntax either. In fact, this is an addition uh, uh, on my part. Uh, he was referred to by many of the Cuban students as El Jamaicano, because his Spanish had, had a real interesting accent. What Mr. Baker did have was a special skill in creating a learning atmosphere where children from kindergarten through 12th grade never thought of themselves as Cubanos or Americanos, as Catholics, Protestants or Jews. What, we, what he had was a love of children, of their potential. He was an American, proud of his heritage, and strong in his beliefs and love of country. He also loved Cuba with all his heart. To those of us who studied under him, we were all alike. We were students at Ruston Academy, with the goal of going on to college in the United States or to the university in Cuba. The school's credo was to teach us English and Spanish equally well, with an emphasis on where we wanted to go and what we wanted to do after high school. The academic curriculum was tough, the standards high. Two flags were always present at school functions the Cuban flag next to the American flag. We sang both anthems. We were taught to respect the history and culture of both countries. Beyond that, Mr. Baker expected us to become good citizens, to respect the rights of others, to appreciate and understand the beauty of democracy, and to love Cuba and the United States equally. He taught all of us that you didn't have to stop loving one to care for the other. Mr. Baker's love for children in Cuba never wavered. When Castro's revolution smothered the island, 
Mr. Baker was one of the key players in setting up Operation Pedro Pan, a desperate move by Cuban parents to send their unaccompanied children out of the island. He worked with Monsignor Brian Walsh in Miami, with U.S. Embassy officials in Cuba, and with Cuban parents who could not bear the thought of having their children indoctrinated in Marxist schools. He did this quietly, without publicity. He was never one to seek the limelight. His goal was someday to return to Cuba and reopen the doors of his beloved Ruston Academy. He always wanted to continue teaching and to try again to bring Cubans and Americans together under one roof with common goals and aspirations. The the sense of the man carries forward in so many different ways. And eventually I will try to web this back into the Pedro Pan story. Uh, he talked about, about his own background as follows in a paper that he wrote in 1998 that talked about his involvement with the Pedro Pan uh, activities. He says, in terms of his background with work in Cuba, I taught in Ruston Academy from 1930 to 1936, returned in 1944, and served as director headmaster from 1945 to 1961. In 1950, my wife and I inherited the school from the founders, Hiram Ruston and his sister Martha. At that time, we established the Fundación Rustin Baker, the first nonprofit educational foundation in Cuba, and turned over to a self-perpetuating board of directors the ownership of the school. Through this action, we strove to perpetuate the school and its service to Cuba. In 1960, I was, in a very true sense, an American Cuban. Cuba was my home, and I wanted to use the rest of my life working for her development. On January 4th, 1961, my wife Sybil and I departed from Havana with five suitcases of clothes and left behind the school, our home, and all our 22 years' work there had produced. We, too, were refugees. Refugees driven from our home by Castro's tyrannical dictatorship. Refugees concerned about the future of the country and the people that we loved. If my father were here today, I think he would have the following reflections himself. First of all, his major focus would be on those of you who came out under the Pedro Pan activity and your parents. He felt that you were the true heroes. In fact, he spent a, the first six months that they were in the United States in 1961, Dad, almost uh, on a daily basis, picked up people arriving at the airport in Miami, uh, working hand in hand with Father Walsh. This, I think, as I've best been able to put things together, is probably pre-George, uh, but maybe it was it, he, they were both there at the same time. I can't really determine that. So his sense of the heroic was in what you had accomplished. And he took great pleasure in being able to feel at least in some way a part of that. He would have focused on others, others that he would have called unsung heroes. And who were these? Well, they were pilots who smuggled documents underneath their pilot caps as they went from Miami to Havana, uh, through KLM, through Pan Am. Uh, these are stories that have come out over time that, that uh, we'll never know the names of those people, but they were there. Uh, there are the cases of the Hikels and the Finleys. Uh, there is the role that was played by not just the American embassy, 
perhaps more important in the long term was the role of the British and the Dutch in this entire process. But I do want to, to share something with you uh, because I know that he would have done this. And that is two things that he wrote about the Hikels and about the Finleys. Senora Serafina Hikel was the leader of the group. She was a tireless worker who handled some of the most dangerous tasks of initiating contacts with parents wishing to send children to safety. One day, her lead took her to a poor section of Havana. She arrived at the site to discover <clears throat> that the apartment she was to visit was located above the office of the Comité de Defensa, <laughs> a neighborhood spy center. Even though she realized that she might be entering a trap, Serafina knocked on the door and helped a desperate mother. On another occasion, her call list took her to a fashionable apartment building in Vidal in which a number of prominent communists lived. Again, it looked like a trap. This time, a communist leader was seeking assistance for her daughter. The parents were scheduled to represent Cuba at an international conference. With the daughter in the States, they would be able to defect to the U.S. after the conference. The members, Frank Finley, as head of KLM Airlines in Cuba, handled the details of arranging flight reservations for majority of the children who came out under the program. The role went well beyond that. Senora Berta Finley, a Rustin teacher, gave major attention to collecting and processing papers and arranging for the Jamaican student visas. Following the Bay of Pigs fiasco, she and Frank were arrested but were released four days later for lack of evidence against them. Fortunately, the day before they were arrested, Berta had become concerned that a servant might inform against them because of the large number of strangers who visited their home. She had, therefore, left with the wife of the Dutch ambassador the passports of 50 children for whom she was seeking Jamaican visas. These are the stories. This is the valor. This, these are the, uh, these are the uh, examples of what was motivating the people who really established and made sure that this program that came to be known as the Pan Operation uh, would be successful. My own reflections can be summarized as follows. Why was my father involved in this? I think you have to you have to read some of the things that, that he wrote about education. You have to read, know something about how he led his own life and what he felt was of highest value. First of all, I think that he believed very strongly that you have to stand up for what you believe in. Secondly, he was strongly committed to not only democratic principles, but picking up on what Juan Clark was saying, uh, beginning to provide more of an education in Cuba as to what civic societies are about, what democracies are about, how they function, types of behaviors that are necessary to make those work. He placed a great deal of value on what he referred to as responsible citizenship. Uh, again, something that Dr. Clark had, had talked about. In my view, what my father did was he helped to launch a tsunami. Many ways would follow the initial work that he did in Havana, along with a handful of people. 
and the, the, the tsunami just spread and spread. Initially, it was a tropical storm because we were talking about 200 people, 200 children that he hoped to get out. Imagínense cuando llegó la información de 14,000. That is, that is, is truly uh, a, an important thing to realize that neither Monsignor Walsh nor my father, nor any other single individual is responsible for what happened. It was a team of people over time, and the, and the leadership changed. But the principles and the focus remained the same, which was to extract Cuban children whose parents wanted to do so, so that they would not be indoctrinated in a Cuban uh, uh, indoctrination program. Uh, in many ways, Dad was the right person at the right time. And why do I say that? Well, how do you bring together in Havana in 1960 the type of uh, chemistry that would lead to Cuban parents going to visit an American who had credibility with those parents because he had devoted his life to educating their children. And the American embassy, who knew that my father, what he stood for, and allowed for this joint initial uh, effort and definition that eventually succeeded as, as it did so well. Uh, I uh, take great pleasure in joining you as, or in sharing with you, uh, a man who was my father, a man who tried to do what any good father would have done in respect to yourselves. Uh, I perhaps uh, have a boat that is called Tibidi Tawara, <laughs> and I could say that uh, any one of the opening speakers se la comió. <laughs> uh, so I don't have the problems that my father had with the language, uh, but I, I can assure you that my sentiment uh, as, as part of your family is very, very strong. Thank you very much.